going to go ahead and call us to order for our green breakfast for November 2023. Um, I'm going to be your MC today. My name is Ashley Palmer, and I'm the Communications and Education Specialist with the Soil and Water Conservation District. We are going to be joined this month by Dr. Sari Karp of Sustainability Matters. There was recently an event she did at the landfill that I was just in love with. I really enjoyed the project and the opportunity, and that really cemented the idea that she definitely needed to come talk to us and share a little bit of her work. So for a brief introduction, Dr. Sari Karp is the Executive Director at Sustainability Matters. In 2018, she founded Sustainability Matters together with Paula Brownlee and Amanda Sheets. Sari earned her PhD at New York University, and today she considers herself a refugee from academia following intense research and professional work in areas of behavioral finance, which sounds very familiar when I was done with academia. I was happy to be into the nonprofit world. Sari lived and taught around the world, including in New York City and Norway, where she first started foraging in the hundreds of acres of forest behind her house, and Israel, where she taught at the Hebrew University and learned to garden. Transitioning to a climate where weeds are more of an issue than a lack of water was quite an adjustment, and today Sari lives in the Shenandoah County, where she fangirls over native trees, experiments with sustainable landscaping, eats her groundhog's leftover vegetables and serves as personal assistant to Sustainability Matters spokes cat, Haim, a clouder of ex-feral cats who accompanied her from Jerusalem and many of her other loving pets. Sari's favorite plant is the spice bush or Appalachian allspice, which is edible in all seasons and the first woody native to bloom in spring, which is so beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Sari Carver of Sustainability Matters as she presents bringing conservation to unexpected places. As always, have grace as we are dealing with technology problems and things like that. I'll be moderating the chat, and if you have any questions, pop them in there. Or when it's time, we'd love to hear your questions in person. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Ashley, and thank you to all of you for inviting me. And um, we are new to the Northern Virginia area, which I is, assume is where most of you are located. Uh, we're pretty new overall. Um, we're a young grassroots nonprofit. Uh, almost five years old at this point. And we really, I, I feel like um, we're the conservation nonprofit with a difference in a way uh, where uh, we say that we are about people as much as we are about the planet. And community is a huge factor for us. And our people, our volunteers, our members, the people that that really come to our events are what have enabled us to grow very quickly in just four and a half years. Um, we've always focused on preaching outside the choir, on drawing in non-traditional conservation audiences, especially I think out here in the valley and in rural areas, conservation can be very politicized uh, and it's often viewed really just as the purview of a particular socioeconomic group, um, particular political persuasion, and there's a very strong from here, come here divide. And that was something that we always sought to bridge because we realized that, okay, if you actually listen, if you, you know, pay attention to somebody else's uh, viewpoint and make something fun and engaging and non-political, we're really on the same page about a lot of things and you can find common ground almost with anybody. And, you know, it sounds like a cliche, but it's really not. And, um, it, you know, just by, by doing fun events, by pulling people in through what we call the gateway programs, uh, they come, you know, maybe to a community plant swap because they want free plants and they end up learning about natives and invasives or they come to a wild edibles walk because foraging is fun um, and end up learning that, oh, most of these wild edibles are actually invasive. This is what an invasive plant is. This is how it got here. This is maybe what we should do about it. Um, being realistic is key for us as well. Uh, and really giving people things that they can do hands-on. We work a lot with young people. We see a lot of climate anxiety, understandably, because our generations have screwed up the planet for them. Um, and we see a lot of people being very overwhelmed and saying, well, I can't, I can't live a zero waste lifestyle. I just can't do that. I'm too busy. I can't, I can't manage. Or, you know, how am I going to get rid of all of my invasives on 25 acres? Or, 
you know, there's nothing I can do to change anything. I have to wait for the laws to change or the corporations to behave differently. And, you know, there's some truth to all of that, but there's also a lot of truth the fact that you can make a difference at home, you know, just by turning part of your lawn into pollinator habitat, by making your own yogurt instead of throwing countless number five plastic containers into the landfill. Those are things you can do and they do add up. And I think that when people then feel empowered by the small things, they will move on to the bigger things uh, and, and really get involved with all of this. Okay, so like I said, we started in 2018. Um, early 2018 grew very, very, very quickly. We started here in the Valley before um, the pandemic. I would say that our footprint was probably Harrisonburg up through Clark County, if you guys know where any of those are. Um, we did in-person education events, really ranging from the Valley's largest ever Earth Day Festival to small workshops at the State Arboretum or with, at farms or yeah, small grower networking events. And uh, then of course, you know, the world came to a screeching halt. Like everybody else, we pivoted, we started doing webinars. Um, and we really, the, those of us who founded Sustainability Matters are, are all educators. I'm a former business school professor, as you heard. Our, one of our co-founders, Paula, is a retired chemist and university president. The other one, Amanda, is actually from Fairfax County. She lives out here now, but she taught in the Fairfax school system for many years. Um, and we were really passionate about high quality education, doing it right. We saw a lot of bad webinars in the beginning of the pandemic. And so we broke down our in-person education. We really rebuilt it for an online audience. And so the webinars are now pulling in global audiences. Uh, they've become really popular. Uh, every time we do one, the audience becomes more international, which is fascinating. We've had uh, a pretty dedicated cadre of Australians and Singaporeans who've been watching for a while. They eat their breakfast while they watch our webinars. Um, if we do something on a Sunday afternoon, we get the Europeans. We've got a lot of Canadians, but the webinar that we did this past week, we had a whole contingent from the Philippines and somebody from Nigeria. So it's definitely someone from Poland who was apparently up in the middle of the night. Um, so it's really hard to say what our footprint is at this point, but we also have had an on the ground project in Virginia expanding, which I will tell you a lot more about later. Uh, I think that's kind of partly why Ashley invited me. It's uh, the event that she attended was part of our Making Trash Bloom project, planting pollinator habitat at landfills. And that started in the Valley and uh, is now in Fairfax, as well as Rappahannock County. Um, but I, you know, a, a big thing for us has really just been, like I said, the human engagement um and creating stuff that people can enjoy so this picture is is an example of one of the gateway events it's a community plant swap uh these are two of our volunteers val and claudia and i love this picture because i still haven't quite figured out if val and claudia know this but they are complete polar opposites politically and they both feel really strongly about their politics but plants brought them together and they just really happily kind of bonding um, over the programming that they're doing for us. And I think that's that's a signature of Sustainability Matters that we bring together people not only of many different backgrounds, but of many different viewpoints that can find common ground in conservation. So seriously making sustainability fun is one of our taglines. Um, we are serious about our fun because if it's not fun, People won't come, they won't do it. And so stuff like this is a, a new monarch migration game that we have for kids. And we have older kids teaching it for the most part. So the ones who are guiding them through that are Mountain Vista Governor School students in this picture. We also have Smithsonian Mason School of Conservation students running the monarch migration game. And um, the little kids just absolutely love it. This was at a con <coughs> conservation day at a local school out here in, in Clark County 
and we were told that um you know the kids just couldn't talk about anything else when they got home and a lot of them have never seen a monarch even out here in the country and maybe they never will but it's really important for them to know um so they definitely enjoy dressing up as well all right so what exactly do we do well there were as you saw on a couple slides ago about 250 programs i'm not going to go through them all uh but just to give you an idea of some of the buckets general buckets that we do uh our primary focus is conservation education one of our flagship series is called greener than grass which started as an in-person program is now webinars and and in person uh, various permutations of sustainable landscaping of replacing your lawn uh, we actually just in the past couple of weeks hosted really geared at the dmv audience and, and pulling a large dmv audience hosted some greener than grass webinars for small space growers um, so one was on native plants um, in small spaces including people who have no space have no land and are just growing in containers and one was on edible landscaping um, and those are available if you want to watch the rough cuts on our our facebook uh, the videos are up there they will eventually be cleaned up and on youtube as well but no um uh, no time frame on that yet uh, we'll we'll see what we get there um, but we also, like I said, we run programs like Wild Edibles Walks. We run you know, kids programs, um, wide variety of conservation programs. We did a weedinar recently talking about uh, sustainable management of weeds and really what to go after, what to leave, how to make your decisions, herbicides versus tilling versus other methods of weed control. Um, very practical just kind of different perspectives uh, and having it be really realistic for people. We also do education on various aspects of food, sustainable sustenance. Uh, that, that picture is of Vittorio. Vittorio teaches um, Italian cheese making for us originally at uh, a, a dairy farm outside Winchester, it's really the only working farm and she's pretty much in retirement now, but it was the only working farm left in that area, which used to be heavily ag, um, right, right in the environs of Winchester. It also is the only animal welfare approved farm in the area and the only organic one. And so people would come because they wanted to make Italian cheese, which was amazing as you can probably tell from the picture but they would also get a farm tour and they would learn about what it means to be animal welfare approved and they usually did not go and buy milk at walmart again after that um most of our food programming is on growing food uh you know how, how to grow your own food how to preserve your own food um troubleshooting just really practical things for novices and for somewhat more advanced people as well uh, We've been working a lot, uh, particularly with the city of Winchester's recycling department on zero waste workshops, programmings around recycling. We get a lot of questions about recycling. Why isn't this recyclable? Why can't I do this? And so we explain the economics of it, but we also, again, show people what they can do. Um, we've had a couple of DEQ funded series on one on composting, uh, composting for the clueless, which was geared at keeping food waste out of landfills. And this year we did preserving for the perplexed, which again, people would come to make yogurt or pickles um, because it's fun, but they would also learn about single use containers and keeping those out of the landfill and start thinking about the rest of their lives. And really what, what else do they use single use containers for? Um, those are available. Those are videos, actually, and they are available on our website. Uh, so you might want to check those out. They're kind of fun. I'm a former business school nerd, so we do do a, quite a bit with business um, and small businesses and really showing them that sustainability does not have to be expensive. Uh, it can actually save you a lot of money. And we bring in you know, business owners who are essentially living that. Um, same thing with farmers. We do a fair amount of outreach to professional ag. Um, 
And it's been, you know, a fraught relationship between conservation and ag, as I'm sure those of you who are involved in the field know. But we're very proud that we are a conservation organization that the farmers talk to and they listen to. And, uh, you know, I got a kick out of one of one of the biggest dairy farmers in, uh, or cattle farmers in um, Rockingham County had been referred to us by the FSA agent down there. And um, this wasn't somebody who normally talked to a lot of conservation organizations or really any. He called me and he first thing he said was, Heather says you're a moderate conservation organization. I've never heard of that before. Tell me about it. And, you know, I mean, he's a great guy. There's a lot that we will never agree on, but um, he's become one of our strongest advocates and he's a really strong voice in the community. And that is why people come to programs like this, Get Paid to Go Green. You see their slide in that. This is something for those of you at the district might be of interest. Um, essentially, what Get, Get Paid to Go Green is, is a series of, of workshops that we do both in person and virtually on cost share programs because they can be very confusing both for just landowners and for farmers uh, so get paid to go green gets everybody together gets the agencies there we force the agency guys to go through their presentations before and make sure it's crystal clear and everybody understands who's eligible and how it works and then they can have individual conversations but crucially, they also hear from their peers. They hear from other landowners, other farmers who actually are in these programs. And they're very honest about the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, and these these programs pay off. So this is, this is an in-person one for ag. Um, and I think 85% of the participants who came to that were uh, scheduled site visits and went into posture contracts. Uh, we did a webinar during the pandemic, which is also on, uh, I think it's linked on our website, it's on our YouTube. And that one, again, pulled a national audience. I think the people representing, people there represented 110,000 acres of land, which is pretty cool. Not sure it all went into conservation practices, but you never know. Uh, we run Sustainable Art Shows, which again is just, you know, it's a gateway program. Uh, one of our volunteers is a professional curator. She used to be director of the Torpedo Factory, actually out in your neighborhood in, in Alexandria. And um, she has a great stable of just sustainability friendly artists. And it introduces a different crowd to, to some of these concepts. Finally, the um, Gen Z project is a, a kind of new fun thing that we are working on with our Smithsonian Mason students. And um, this Mountain Vista Governor School students, and it's an, an outreach project really trying to figure out their generation and how to get their generation involved in conservation. And they are the ones that are that are driving on it and that it and essentially are the, the professional advisors. Um, all right, so I'm gonna speed up a little bit. I see that I'm, I guess we started a little bit late, but I'm also running a little bit behind. Um, we partner a lot to do this as a small organization that started with no resources. Uh, we have had to, and we want to, to really leverage everybody's uh, expertise. So this is a, a small selection of, of the partners, um, partner with a lot of agencies, partner with Blandy um, and schools, and more and more directly with localities, counties, cities, uh, and these, oh, by the way, these are these are some of our uh, Mountain Vista Governor School students. This was at the Earth Day seeding party for uh, phase two of the Making Trash Bloom project, which I am now moving into. We say that we bring conservation to unexpected places, uh, and that's really how we reach these audiences. We don't wait for them to come to us. We don't wait for them to come to an environmental education center. We do work in environmental education centers, but you've got to bring conservation to people. And so in a rural area with no trash pickup, everybody goes to the landfill. Um, this is the Shenandoah County landfill. This is the site of our original Making Trash Bloom project. What you're looking at here is drone footage of 
the Earth Day hydro seeding of phase two. Um, so what they, they are spraying the seeds on a closed trash cell and right next to it, that black liner, that's where the trash is being dumped now. Um, so it's literally, you know, right next to the active cell, uh, which is pretty cool because, um, you know, you can, you can literally see the change happening. Okay, so making trash bloom, I said, pollinator meadows at landfills, uh, particularly pollinator meadows at trash cells, though we started with a pilot plot that was just, just on the site. Why do it? Kind of a no-brainer. Um, the land is useless. When landfills cover up a trash cell, you can't build on it. You can't plant trees on it under current DEQ regulation. You can't grow crops on it. There's nothing you can do with it. And especially in areas like Northern Virginia, but even out in the valley, land is becoming more and more precious. Habitat, wild land is becoming more and more precious. And we might as well do something with it. Currently, the go-to practice is planting with turf grass, uh, planting with the same stuff that we're telling people to get rid of their lawns. This is what landfills are putting on trash cells. They have to mow it. Doesn't have great erosion control. Um, sometimes there's less badiza in the mix and the less badiza is hideously invasive and also not nearly as good for erosion control as it's advertised. Um, so this is a great opportunity to just from a conservation perspective, repurpose what's basically dead land. Um, the landfills are interested in part because it is better erosion control with native perennials. Um, and less mowing. That's really how I sold the Shenandoah County landfill where we started this on that. Um, they kind of like the idea of pretty flowers at the landfill, but the main thing was less mowing. Um, it is also, as I mentioned, the ultimate demonstration site. So Shenandoah County, the pilot plot, which you're seeing here, right on the main road where all of the traffic inside the landfill goes, 100,000 cars go past that every year. They go past the interpretive signage, they see it. Uh, Fairfax is really leveling that up. Uh, about a million people are gonna go past the Fairfax site, which is right at the entrance to the I-66 landfill. And there are signs advertising the project on the main road outside, which according to VDOT pulls in about 12 million cars a year. Um, so it's a great way to raise awareness. There is also, and the jury is still out on this, this was not an intended uh, part of the project, but it may be happening. We may be revolutionizing landfill management. Um, that is a long way off, but current practices are when they cap a landfill to cover it with uh, a thick layer of black plastic, which is basically the same thing that you put underneath the trash. It's a landfill capping plastic trash liner um not very sustainable also it really does break down eventually over time uh but there's an alternative method called phyto capping which is capping with plants instead of plastic and studies in india and australia have shown that phyto capping does a better job of controlling moisture taking up toxins uh it is currently not the practice in the u.s but um we have a few opportunities to test this on unfinished cells where the roots are going directly into the um into the trash and see what happens so we're very excited about that and we're also excited that deq is behind this project and they're really very interested in seeing how the plantings go and whether they might um soon start recommending planting native perennial mixes instead of turf grass on a landfill basically there's nothing that we can do with it we can't build on it it's basically just hills of trash grass and and weeds is basically all it is sustainability matters um, called in the office and introduced the idea of a flower plot when sorry came to us about this plot for the bees and the bugs and the birds and everything. We did an experimental spot. Actually, it's along the road for people to stop and see and identify what flowers are blooming and what's happening. 
we decided we were going to have a party at the landfill and have an opening day, invite the community to explain to them what we're doing, and we invited them to plant flower seeds. Once we get into where we can do a five acre and that's going to be stabilized for the rest of its life, then this will go on it and continue to grow. So far, everything looks really good this year. We've got a little grass problem and, you know, this isn't experimental. This is something that we're going to have to fight through. So at first, the guys here, our employees, they were like, oh, this thing's not going to work out. It's not going to bloom. Eventually, the flowers started popping up and the guys would ride by and send me pictures. Hey, you've got flowers blooming. So they were pretty excited about it. I've seen people go by and stop, read the sign, get out, walk up to the sign and then try to figure out what flowers are growing. And then they go on. And a lot of times you'll see the same person a couple of weeks later stop again just to see if you can pick out something else new. That's basically why we did the test pad. So other landfills can learn from us. So once we get established and make it go, then the whole hill would be nothing but flowers. And actually that's a standout point because if it's blooming and colorful, then they're going to want to know what it is. And then we can tell them it's for the birds, the bees, it's for the future. And everything just rolls right along. And we're doing something for nature. So the fall of 2019, we planted that pilot plot. We actually solarized it for the whole summer before that using a landfill trash liner. So it was exactly 20 feet wide and 100 feet long because that's the size of a landfill trash liner. And the whole county drove past uh, what, during what, what was going on with that black plastic. It was weighed down with with trash, basically, with old railroad tries and um, tires and that kind of thing. And so by the time we actually seeded it at this party at the landfill that you're seeing, uh, everybody knew what was going on. And a lot of people came out. We had really diverse crowds at that. And people felt there was buy-in. Um, the next spring, stuff germinated. Then the first month, it got accidentally mowed because it's a landfill and stuff happens. Part of it has also now been accidentally herbicided. Uh, this wouldn't have happened if we had, you know, helped plant the meadow at Blandy or Greenspring or wherever. But we're doing it in a landfill for, for a reason. And it really did become, that summer, it became a pandemic tourist destination. People were coming from other counties to see it. You would meet families there who were coming every few weeks with their kids to see what was blooming and then coming back. Um, we hooked up some families with Get Paid to Go Green and got them into VCAP or Equip, but what, to actually do what the county calls the flower plot at home. Um, and that's, you know, that is the goal. So this is, oh, this was actually supposed to be the, oops, that was supposed to be the, so, um, so we really were able to level that up the year later in 2021, um, had all kinds of educational events at the dump, uh, brought out the Chamber of Commerce. Don't think the Chamber of Commerce, most of the people knew what native plants were before, uh, but they had a great time and they learned about it. We also ran some workshops there. Uh, this was a, as you see, a native plant education workshop we, and some herbal medicine using native plants shops, uh, some kids programs. And we also started leveling up the scientific angle, pulling in some experts from our technical advisory board, from the state arboretum. Uh, the main person who has been coming up with a lot of these seed mixes so far has been Jack Monstead, who is the primary curator for the native meadows at the arboretum. So he's really number one native meadow expert. Um, but we also, this is very much a pilot project. Any of you who has tried to plant a meadow knows how hard it is. It's stratospherically harder at landfills. You have maybe a foot to two feet of soil on top of the liner if you're planting on top of a liner. 
uh, you usually have a very sloped surface because of DEQ regulations. You can't have it bare ground for more than a couple of days. And um, you have way more invasive pressure. There is, I think, probably not a landfill in Virginia that has not deliberately planted Saracea lespedeza because it was actually being recommended for decades. Um, hideously invasive. You also obviously have people bringing all kinds of brush and weed seeds. And we learned the hard way with the pilot plot. Uh, we planted it in November, partly for political and scheduling reasons, but um, anyway, over the winter, all the thistle got in, the snap weed got in. Uh, fortunately, the natives are pushing it out, but now it's having less Bidisa problems. So really what, what we're doing on all three of our current sites is collecting a lot of data and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And a key partner in this has been Mountain Vista Governor School. It's a governor school that covers about seven counties out in the valley in the Piedmont, um, two different campuses, focus on science and technology, and it has been fantastic to have the kids working with us on a wide range of projects, uh, but particularly making trash bloom. They are coming out, they are doing citizen science, they are monitoring biodiversity at um, the Shenandoah landfill and at the second site at the Rappahannock landfill. All right, and that has leveled up this year into data at the dump, our science team. Uh, the one problem with the governor's school is that the kids inconveniently go on vacation in the summer when the meadows are at their most active. Uh, so we started recruiting our adult volunteers, um, partnering with some master naturalists and really building a strong science team. Uh, and actually an article about it that the local paper did got picked up by the Associated Press, ended up in newspapers all over the country. So this guy that you see here, who's one of our volunteers, ended up in the Washington Post and, you know, San Francisco, whatever thing. And it, it was a big deal for him. But um, the, yeah, so these, these are our volunteers that come out. They're trained by our, our um, scientific programs person, Hannah, um, who is a naturalist, really in, in how to collect the data. They enter it into iNaturalist, uh, and occasionally we have big events. So this is what you see inside people with the nets um, was our first annual big bug bio blitz led by Jim McNeil, who's a Smithsonian entomologist. And we brought out teams from the State Arboretum, from the USDA, our science team, the Mountain Vista students, and they collected coolers full of Ziploc insects uh, to be studied later in the year and, and really compare uh, across different um, uh, the th now three different sites that we planted there. So this is how things have expanded this year. What you saw in the video was the pilot plot. This year, we're phase two was hydro seeded on Earth Day. Um, phase three, we planted in September. The hydro seeding is a big issue because this is how most landfills seed. And normally, of course, they're seeding turf grass. It is not a recommended method for seeding native plants. Um, but if this project is going to scale up and be something that many, many landfills can use, we really have to figure out a way to make the hydro seeding work with native plants uh, because they're going to use what they have. And the more obstacles you put up, the more barriers you put up, the less likely it is that something's going to be adopted. So phase three is a test of four different methods. One is the control method, the normal hydro seeding method. One is the hand seeding method, which mimics what a seed drill would do. And then there's two experimental hydro seeding methods. One of them, uh, it was developed by Mark Feely, who is the chief horticulturist at Earth Seed. They're one of the sponsors of the project. And the other was developed by Brad at the landfill and his team. Because the one thing about conservationists, conservationists don't know a lot about hydro seeding because they don't do it. Landfill guys know a ton. Um, so it's been, it's been a really fun collaboration. And uh, in the spring, we'll see how it goes. And then October, we expanded. Um, landfill number two. Rappahannock County, tiny landfill, almost a Lespedisa monoculture. Uh, so that's in a bunch of pilot plots now. Um, 
again, we had a wonderful seating party and we always kind of have parties when we plant this stuff, community involvement, it's great. Um, so this was the community seating and we even had a Mountain Vista Governor School student, this amazingly talented young man with the curly hair. He, he's a choreographer. And so this was hand seated and the seeds had to be tamped down. Um, so he choreographed a seating dance with a lot of stomping and uh, set to Beyonce. And people just had a blast. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and finally, in your neck of the woods, um, right around Halloween, we planted at the I-66 landfill. Uh, so this is phase two that you can see here. Uh, sorry, phase one um, in the I-66 landfill, making trash bloom. Um, great time people came dressed as pollinators we encouraged the halloween costumes uh these are the the whole, actually entire current practicum class of the smithsonian mason school of conservation two of them are our interns uh the rest are pretty much volunteering for us they just love the opportunity to put on their wings and um come out and party and we're excited because of the reach in fairfax and the opportunity to do a lot more there with with different communities. So coming up um, for Making Trash Bloom in 2023, uh, and some of this is funded, some of it isn't. So, um, you know, but what is funded is phase two. This is actually, and it's bigger than it looks, it's about another acre. Um, phase two in Fairfax, it's an area, if any of you are familiar with the I-66 landfill, it's basically right next to the big recycling barns. It's a steep sloped area that has a lot of landfill pipes. We have yet to plant right around landfill pipes and we are very interested and the landfill is very interested to see how that works um, because this is an area with an unusually high concentration of the landfill pipes. Uh, we've also been approached by a number of other landfills, so we are looking into funding to being able to expand the project. Um, Fauquier County is particularly enthusiastic and is, is hoping to be landfill number four, so fingers crossed for that one. A new program that we are very much hoping to get funded, uh, so as I'd mentioned, we really work primarily with Mountain Vista Governor's School out in Shenandoah and in Rappahannock, but Fairfax school system, although they are super enthusiastic about the project, has a lot more bureaucratic restraints. It's harder for them to get the kids off campus and, and really just to pivot and to do something like this. Uh, so we're trying to set up an independent program uh, focusing particularly on young women, um, high school women, particularly women from underrepresented groups who may not really be aware of conservation and certainly aware of conservation careers. I think a lot of you have, have probably seen that there are many enthusiastic young women who get into conservation, don't necessarily rise to the top yet. Um, and we would like to help that change. We also have the environmental services industry uh, through Republic Services and some waste associations that would like to see more women in environmental engineering and those type of programs. So this would basically be those girls recruited from the Fairfax County area, from the public school system, coming out, doing the citizen science, getting additional training, being mentored by female college students at the Smithsonian Mason School of Conservation. So they would be able to see girls just like them, uh, you know, like these girls, um, mentoring them through the citizen science. Uh, and there would also be an aspect where women who have really become leaders in the conservation field and in environmental fields, whether it's in agencies or nonprofits or environmental prosecutors or sustainable business leaders, uh, would do career Q and A's and, and kind of talk about what it takes to to get to where they are. So that's something that you know we're we've got some a grant out for it. Um, fingers crossed that that we'll be able to do that. And finally, we are hoping to do some other things in Fairfax as well. Uh, we are talking to the Department of Public Works, our friends from the landfill, on a program encouraging people to compost at home so that they don't end up having to pick up as much lawn waste, or even better yet, lose your lawn altogether. I think Fairfax is a great opportunity where the county or 
it's public work seems willing to really get behind this and say, all right, we don't actually want to be this sterile suburban wasteland. We're willing to come out and say, we want you to replace your lawn with something else. Maybe we'll even give you some incentives. To that. We want you to keep your clippings and compost. Um, so that's those are programs that we're exploring. Um, kind of further down the line, Obviously, it's a more business intensive area, so I would like to expand our, our green business outreach, and we would also like to expand outreach to the immigrant community. So that's a lot. Um, and we hope that some of you will choose to get involved. It. Um, check out our website. There are lots of different ways you can get involved. I would be remiss as a nonprofit ED not to ask you to become a member. Please become a member. Uh, we do, as a small grassroots nonprofit, we're not part of a or national organization. We don't have big funders. Most of our funding comes from restricted grants. We have been very fortunate to get restricted grants and, and really get them cold with no connections being chosen out of thousands of applicants nationwide for these projects. But we're limited in terms of, you know, when people come to us with some great idea and say, oh, you know, can you do X, Y, Z? If it's not funded, we usually can't because we don't have the unrestricted funding and membership really helps with that. Business sponsorship also, uh, we're looking for business partners for next year. So if you own a business or know a business that would like to get involved, please point them toward that on our website. Volunteers, um, definitely recruiting for the science teams um, for what will be a new program next year, Docents at the Dump. Uh, volunteers giving tours of the Making Trash Bloom project. Uh, we are also recruiting for our board of directors and for more specialized roles. If you're good at video photography, we're interested in that. And last but very much not least, we are currently hiring. Um, we're hiring for a couple of positions and expect to be hiring for one or two more next year. Um, so definitely check that out on our website. While we're thinking up our questions, I'll start with one that came up in the chat. Um, so I would like to know how much money is required to start the program with girls in Fairfax schools. Oh, excellent question. Um, I think it depends on how much comes in from grants, but preliminary version of the program, um, I would say that we would need about 35,000 uh, for the first year. Uh, and that would be reaching up to 60 girls for about a seven month period, kind of starting a couple months before the meadow starts to germinate and continuing through the end of the blooming season. Um, and then, you know, we we would hope to be able to, to kind of scale that um, and develop it further. It's going to depend a little bit too on how much of the environmental uh, education angle comes, or the environmental science and waste management uh, angle gets gets involved as well. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, it's sometimes hard to imagine what all goes in to making that work happen. So that's a really great point. Yeah, it's huge amount of planning and there's kind of layers of mentorship because our Hannah Beamant, who's our scientific programs catalyst, we call her, will be developing the curriculum and doing some of the preliminary training by Zoom, but also training. And we, we want to be able to pay the Smithsonian Mason students that we hire for this. You know, this is not a volunteer thing. They are going to be doing a job mentoring the students and <clears throat> they need summer jobs. And this is <clears throat> going to start even before the summer. So they have to be trained and then they're going to be out there a lot working with the girls. <coughs> That's great. Well, for our next question, I'll throw it over to Willie Wood, our executive director. He's got his hand. <coughs> Oh, thank you. Sarah, you're doing a wonderful job out there. It's a lot of uh, multifaceted kind of thing you're working on. And this is more of a hands-on experience um, question because our district works with the Fairfax County Park Authority in establishing um, um, meadows and things of the nature that you're doing. I also know that for a success for a meadow establishment, you got to have good soil seed contact at the beginning. How do you go over that that hump, considering you have limitations or restrictions as to how long you can leave a bare soil without any ground cover? So that is an excellent question. And 
that's something that we are experimenting with in different ways in each of our three current sites. Um, Fairfax in some ways is the easiest because the Fairfax Department of Public Works actually owns a native seed drill. Um, so, which is the best way to seed. So they don't have to hide or seed. Um, and they've got a lot of experience with this. They also have the mega tractors required to pull the native seed drill up a very steep slope. Um, but it's all, you know, as with any meadow, it's a question of what time of year you seed and putting in cover crops. So actually, our, our previous seeding parties at Rappahannock and at Shenandoah, literally the seeding takes place while people are there. Either if it's a small area, it's hand seeded or they watch the hydro seeding or something. With Fairfax, it was really mostly a post seeding party um, because they did site prep before. They did it with the native seed drill. The drill was there for people to, to kind of see it. And there was a little bit of hand seeding for community engagement, um, but actually you could kind of see in those pictures, you could see a green fuzz coming up. And the green fuzz was the winter rye, the cover crop that had been planted only I think 12 days before that. And it was already germinating um, and, and coming up because it was, it was very, the site was extremely well prepped because they have the equipment. Uh, so in Fairfax, you're in great shape because there's the right tools. Um, it's not going to stop the invasives from coming in. I mean, there's basically a calorie pear orchard on either side of the site that we've planted. So that's going to be a journey, but it got off to a good start anyway. Yeah, go yes, for it, Pat. I have a question. This is Beverly. Hi. Yes, there's another landfill in Fairfax that is either uh, closed or in the process of closing, and it's a Lorton landfill. Did you consider that site? As a um, I think there's actually, two, it, it's a little confusing. There, there seem to be two landfills over in that direction. One, the large one is the I-95 landfill. Um, and so, yes, we did. Um, we talked to uh, Public Works about both I-95 and I-66. Um, the main, I mean, we chose... I-66 for a couple of reasons. One was proximity for our team because most of us are coming from the Valley. And so it's a lot easier to get to, you know, the Centerville Fairfax area than all the way down to Lorton. Um, there was also a really ideal site there, like where we've planted phase one and where phase two are gonna be are right inside the entrance. Everybody's gonna see them. Uh, and they have already, uh, one of the reasons why we were excited to work with Fairfax is because Public Works actually already has done some meadow planting at um, I-95, not on a trash cell, which is what we're doing now, but a few years ago, they planted some honeybee habitat um, out in just an open area of the landfill. So there, there already was a little bit out there. For something like that. Thank you. But I would not be against, you know, doing I-95 eventually too. Uh, I mean, our goal is to keep kind of scaling this up and eventually in theory, potentially do all of I-66 because it's all a closed, they're both closed landfills. Um, they haven't accepted trash for ages and, um, I'm not sure about 95, but 66 is, is actually in what's called post-closure, which means it closed more than 30 years ago. It closed in 1982, so. Um, what is your favorite part of your job? Oh gosh. Um, that's a tough question because for me, this wasn't something I planned to do. We were kind of an accidental nonprofit. Um, we sort of naively thought that this was going to be a fun volunteer activity. And uh, it, within a few months, it was clearly taking over our lives. And it was either scale it down to almost nothing or scale up and become a nonprofit. Uh, so it has been a constant journey of discovery. And I think that one of the things that really fascinates me is meeting such a wide range of people. Um, you know, 
I did not really get to do that when I was teaching MBA students for a living. And, you know, I've met so many fascinating people in the conservation community, in the agricultural community, and people who, like Brad, who maybe weren't in the conservation community, but are now. And so, um, so that's that's been really exciting for me. And also, obviously, just being able to see the impact and being able to see, okay, people are actually changing practices and doing great things because of what we're doing. And that's, that's wonderful. Actually, I do have another question. In the beginning, you mentioned the word weeds, and I don't remember in the context. And of course, we all say weeds. Has anyone ever come up with a definition of weeds? You mean other than a plant in the wrong place? Uh, so what we talk about, and that's actually how we, we kind of led off our weedinar, which is also on our Facebook in the video section, um, if anybody's interested in watching it, is really what is a weed? You know, um, and uh, can natives be considered weeds? Are all weeds in, just invasives? You know, uh, how do you kind of pick your battles among that? And um, obviously, in general, we would encourage people to go after the invasives um, and not mind the aggressive natives. But I have you know, on, on my property, I have some natives that I would be totally happy to have in moderation, but they are so aggressive that they're crowding out the other stuff in the pollinator meadows. And I don't want a monoculture of wingstem uh, or pokeweed. So, you know, it's, uh, I think there's a personal, you know, kind of personal definitions of, of it. Um, and I mean, we talk a lot about, you know, it's really unfortunate that milkweed is called a weed or butterfly weed is weed and uh, versus butterfly bush, and it, which is horrible and actually very weedy. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a charged term, um, but one that gets people's attention. Thank you. Thank you again to our amazing speaker, Sarah. You came to talk to us about Sustainability Matters today. It's such a really great program. And if you have any way to get involved, um, please consider it. This is our last Green Breakfast for 2022. We will see you guys again on Saturday, January 14th, 2023. We are still working on finalizing the 2023 speaker lineup. So if you have any recommendations of great speakers or people working on amazing projects like Sari, please let us know. Sari, I'll have to pick your brain for all of your great contacts to see who's going to join us next year. Um, but I will return everyone to their Saturdays. Thank you so much for joining us.